Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our count city council meeting for October 26th. It is 6 p.m. Call the meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Ortega. <laughs> Mayor Ortega. Oh, sorry, here. <laughs> Council Member Thompson. Here. Council Member Estes. Here. Council Member Applegate. Here. Council Member Geek. Here. Council Member Duncan. Here. All seven or six members present. Okay, uh, which is all members. It's hard to hear. I like I can't hear you at all on that. Um, I okay, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just my hearing. Uh, before we get moving, I want to, um, if, if you'll indulge me, please, uh, have a quick moment of silence for General Colin Powell. Um, I think he's kind of the representation of what I think a lot of us would hope our po politicians would be, even though he wasn't a politician. I wish he would have been, because um, I think he could have brought everybody together and, and worked in a good way. Of, um, But he was just an outstanding uh, leader and, and, more importantly, an outstanding individual in person. So just real quick, uh, a quick moment of silence for General Powell. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and move through our agenda. We have no items under presentations and appointments. Uh, City Council agenda requests and announcements. I'll start with Miss Duncan. Okay, good evening to everyone. Um, I had a meeting with John Trilch on our city strategic plan. We had a great discussion on how to keep moving Fountain forward. It was a great discussion. I've also been to a 2021 ballot measure review on the issues that are on our ballot. That was a great discussion also. I want to also state the residents meeting to discuss service plan amendment for Ventana residents, they had a Facebook Live, and it was regarding the service plan amendment, and once they realized that I was counsel, no one was on the call but two or three people. So once they realized that I was counsel, that, um, you know, I immediately logged off. So they were discussing issues. It never got discussed while I was on the phone call. So I just wanted to disclose that up front. Um, also, construction of the military access, mobility, and safety improvement project. Advanced warning signage will, be, will result on north and southbound I-25. At nighttime, they will have lane closures. The draft of the physical year 2023 through 2027 draft transportation improvement program is open for the public comment from October the 16th to November the 12th. This is with the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, and you can go to Transportation Improvements to find out more information. Fountain for Carson High School and the 4th Infantry Band will be having a Veterans Day concert on Thursday, November the 4th at 7 p.m. at Fountain for Carson High School Auditorium. And that's all I have. All right, thank you. Mr. Geek? Nothing for me tonight. All right, Mr. Applegate? Nothing tonight. Ms. Estes? Nothing tonight. Ms. Thompson? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to report on a few things. Um, I went to a meeting at the Resource Exchange. Uh, they had an appreciation thing. Um, and uh, one thing that was really interesting to learn during that is the how their mission is changing under their new board of directors and their new director. And um, they are really, really working hard that if you have a shortage on employees, call the Resource Exchange and um, they can possibly work with you on hiring someone with a disability that is looking for a job. It's one of the most underemployed populations in, in at least Colorado, I'm sure a lot of places, but a lot of those people are looking for jobs. And so um, if you need some work, um, they have told some great stories of some people that they help find jobs through their um, their organization. So that's called the Resource Exchange or TRE. And um, 
representative, former representative Landgraf here is now on their board of directors, so uh, you could probably contact her, and she can get you information also for someone that's looking for a job. Some great stories out there. Um, I can't believe Mr. Geek didn't say this, but uh, the new fire engine is in town. And that was exciting to see that come in, roll in on Friday, and uh, watch them put it in actions and see the training going on. So thank you for inviting us all over to that. That was really interesting to watch. I know my son had a great time. I cannot believe one of those uh, firemen got him into the truck with them. So he's usually pretty shy about stuff like that. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. He jumped right in, though. He, I was watching he had that. Been he out was several, like, yep, he'd been I'm out in. several times, and then he just up and jumped in there. So that was. <laughs> That was cool. He's never wanted to do it before, so thank you. And um, I'd like to do a shout out to Kimberly and uh, her group for the music that was out at City Hall. I got to come one of the nights, first night, and it, thank heavens it wasn't freezing this year, at least the first night. And they had a really good uh, guitar player, and if they continue that, I really encourage people to come by. It's, it's good quality entertainment. It's free. All you have to do is bring a lawn chair. And we had last Friday, Pikes Peak Area Council Governments. Uh, I was part of a group that put together a legislative round table. We had, I think, 10 or 12 state representatives and senators that came to the meeting, and we had a great time of sharing what was important to us as a region and what was important, what bills were they going to possibly run this year. It was very interesting to learn about. Uh, one of the things that came through loud and clear from every local official that was there was to really not send us a bunch of unfunded mandates um, that it really affects our local budgets when those things come down and we have to implement them also some of the things they do fund can affect us because we might have to cut a, a program to stay under our Tabor limit with the funding that might come through so to be, please be very thoughtful and research how the things can affect us locally and it's always great to build those relationships with different people and and I think uh, one of the bills uh, representative Exum was talking about running is something that um, because we collaborated uh, he may or may not run it because there might be a program to take care of it already. So that would be great. Um, then also, can't read my own scribbles. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about greenhouse gas emissions and how that is affecting us. Uh, GHG, been a lot of conversations with um, some of the rules that were brought down last year and it's in the rulemaking process right now and how that could affect our local projects. And it's gonna be really important that we stay at the table. We do have, uh, we are represented through PPACG. Um, they are on the, on the record as being the person that's responsible, but we still need to be at the table because um, if some of the rules are made, they can have effects on the projects we want to do on local builds. If a committee of people determine that a road widening project to help with congestion um, has too much um, emissions that come with us and our area is close to being over the emission standards that are arbitrarily set and we have no control over emissions coming from other parts of the country and the world, um, they could deny our project. So it's very important we be at the table for those conversations so that we can do the work we need to do in our community and our tax dollars have been collected for. And I know um, uh, Dietra mentioned the MAMSIT project. That's something we've been at the table for years now with. That project has taken almost 20 years to put together from just an idea to where we're at today. And we've had people at the table. I'd like to thank Brandy Williams, our city engineer, from being at the table with that, continuing to fight for our area. Thank you, Brandy and funding and things that need to be done. And um, she's gonna continue with that. Um, but uh, the shoulders that are gonna be widened are basically coming from a suggestion that a former fire chief in this area made to me. And I took it back to the group and Brandy, I took it to Brandy and we're like, you know, this is really important. If we can't get a third lane down here, uh, let's get the shoulders widened so that we can get our public safety officials off the freeway and the people who have an accident or their car breaks down so that we can get the traffic flow so that's just some of the reports I have of a few things that I've done in the last couple of weeks. So thank you for being tolerant with all that, but a lot of meetings. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, the trunk or treat this Friday starting at 5? Five? 5 right here, in, uh, 5 to 7 in front of um, City Hall. Uh, and then we're going to have people spaced out. Um, masks if you want to wear them if not it's outside so there's a lot we're kind of a little more relaxed with that um, and then saturday night the fountain up event what are we calling it 
Nightmare on Main Street. Nightmare on Main Street, sorry. Um, out here on Main Street as well, and so that will be a, a lot of fun uh, to come out, kind of like the old days of our downtown event. So um, looking forward to both those events and, and uh, seeing everybody have a good time. Of course, Halloween, uh, Sunday night, so just be careful with the kiddos out um, and running in front of cars when they're not supposed to be. Um, but uh, just kind of keep an eye if you're out in the neighborhoods driving around and, and uh, taking care of that business. So... Um, I think that's it for me. I don't have anything else. Uh, oh, no, uh, election, a week. Uh, turn in your ballots by, if you're going to hand deliver it by that Tuesday, if you got to send it, it's got to be, no, oh, is it over? Yep, don't say that. Mail. No more mailing. you got to get it in if you want it, uh, if you want it counted, because uh, past this date, it doesn't, it's not going to make it, so, well, then, then I can't guarantee it's going to make it, so, Dropbox. um, drop box, we have one here at our, uh, north side of our, uh, police station, and of course they're all over the place. There's one in uh, Fountain Creek uh, Park as well, the two closest, and then all over town, they're all over. So um, get your ballot in. Um, okay, we'll move on to item number six, public to be heard. Citizens may address the council on items that are not on our agenda. We ask the council, or council may not be able to provide a immediate answer, but was a, a direct staff to follow up. And out of respect for the council and others in attendance, we ask that you limit your comments to Three minutes or less. I didn't get any cards tonight. Just want to see if anybody has anything. Okay. We'll move on to item number seven, our consent agenda. Uh, we have no consent agenda, so I'm not even going to go through that. Um, right? Good. Okay. Item eight, old business. Uh, second reading, 8A, second reading of ordinance number 1769. Settling appropriations for the funds, offices, and departments of the City of Fountain, Colorado, for the fiscal year 2022, beginning January 1, 2022. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me now? I guess so, okay. <laughs> Thank you again. John Lewis, Finance Director uh, for the City of Fountain. Uh, we, uh, as you know, we developed and proposed a fiscal 2022 budget with the uh, 2021, 2022 biennial budget. Uh, and now we've had uh, two additional work sessions this year for, tw for the 2022 budget. Had one on June 8th, one on September 14th. And, uh, and then we had several months of meetings with uh, the staff and then proposed an initial budget, uh, as you know, uh, just uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, after uh, publishing uh, the, the public hearing uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, local newspaper. Uh, the October 12th public hearing at that reading, um, we uh, had a couple revisions that you had requested. They have now been included in this budget. Uh, those uh, revisions included uh, 100,000 for a uh, beacon staff a position in the police department that was funded by a grant, so both the revenue and the expenditures are shown. And in addition, uh, 50,000 was added to uh, streets uh, budget uh, to uh, uh, make some additional um, improvements to uh, some of our streets. So uh, at this point, I would like to see if there are any questions. Um, I, I can tell you that for for all funds, as I'm scrolling down through here um, in our um, digital budget, uh, the uh, the total is um, uh, 74946405 and it will add $3,457.48 uh, uh, to uh, reserves. So um, overall, we're increasing reserves and uh, um, I would ask now if there's any questions. All right, any questions from council? Mm, I'm not seeing any from council, any from public?
staff, any last minute additions? No. No. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, Mr. Geek? Okay. Uh, I think we're good, John. We're going to okay. move forward. All right. So okay. I would I would ask, uh, well, staff recommends approving ordinance number 1769 on this, the second reading. Okay. Mr. Geek? I'd like to make a motion to approve. And Ms. Duncan? You want to finish reading it? 17, oh, sorry. 1769 on the second reading. I Sorry. second. <laughs> All right. I apologize. That's right. All right, we have a motion and second for approval. Um, on second reading, please vote. Six yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council. All right, thank you. All right, item number nine. Nine uh, A, we had no consent agenda tonight, so we'll move into item nine B, a public hearing and resolution for um, resolution 21 058. A resolution approving an amended and restated service plan for the Remuda Ridge Metropolitan District. Ms. Martinez. Right. Good evening, Christy Martinez with the City of Fountain Planning Department. Um, I'm going to go through the presentation with the help of IT because we apparently lost our pointer. Um, so the item before you tonight is the amended and restated service plan for the Remuda Ridge Metro District. Uh, the Remuda Ridge Metro District is a Title 32 uh, special district, um, which is established under statute Title 32, which is the Special Districts Act. The original district was organized in 2007 and approved by the City Council sitting at that time with resolution 07-038. Uh, metro districts are independent governmental entities um, used to finance, design, install, construct, um, operate and maintain various public improvements within developments. Uh, for the Bermuda Ridge Metro District, they're looking to finance various public improvements and amenities that are needed for the Aspen Ranch development. Some of those uh, improvements include water, sewer, park and recreation, um, drainage and streets. The initial boundaries within the district um, do, like as I mentioned, encompass the Aspen Ranch uh, development, which is approximately 59 acres, located at the southeast corner of Link Road and Kane. The uh, Aspen Ranch development is proposing 227 single-family residential lots and a one-acre public safety center site located along Watchman and Link. Within the district financing, um, as you can see in the table uh, between the comparison of the original 2007 service plan and the proposed 2021 service plan, they had a debt service of 30 mills and an operating and maintenance uh, mill levy of 10 with a maximum aggregate of 50 mills and a debt limit of 2 million. Compared to the 2021 service plan that's being presented tonight, they're proposing a debt service of 40 mills and O&M of 10 mills with a maximum aggregate still remaining at the 50. However, they are proposing to increase their debt limit $8 million from 2007. Um, that is necessary in order to cover the increase in the construction cost from the 14 year gap and the um, inflation that has occurred during that time. They're also being, the district's being cautious to ensure that they are not overburdening their future residents with those excessive mills. Um, they're being cautious of the amount of debt that they would incur that would ultimately be passed on to those future residents. The district is anticipating issuing bonds in 2023. They are also expecting a developer advance of $7.3 million. And then all debt that's incurred by the district would need to be discharged no later than 40 years from the first debt of issued. Um, they're expecting, um, and they did their financial plans through an independent CPA, that the uh, actual value of a, the average value of a single family resident in that development would be approximately $400,000. So at even the maximum mill levy of the 50 mills, it would be approximately fourteen dollars to $1,500 uh, that would be assessed on their property uh, taxes for just the special district. The... Um, Amended and service, uh, restated service plan does comply with all of the statutory findings outlined in revised statute 321203. All proper notice was provided, which included um, notice to the petitioner, all governing bodies and special districts that assessed um, ad valorem taxes uh, within three mile radius. They published within the local newspaper and then notified all of the property owners within the district boundaries. Since the Aspen Ranch development is still vacant, there is still only one owner um, within the district boundaries. At this time, staff would not oppose the approval of uh, Resolution 21058 tonight, which would be approving the Bermuda Ridge Metropolitan District Amended and Restated Service Plan. Are there any questions for staff? All right. Ms. Thompson? Um, no, that was, I wanted to comment after the budget. 
Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll just reserve it for the end. Okay, I didn't even see that. I'm sorry. Um, okay, go ahead, Mr. Applegate. Yeah, is this in one page? It's Aspen Ranch, and over here it's Ramunda Ridge Road exhibits. Is it Ramunda Ridge or is it Aspen Ranch? The Metro District name is Ramuda Ridge, which dates back to the 2007 time period when that original development was named Ramuda Ridge. Between 2007 and present, the development name has changed from Ramuda Ridge to Aspen Ranch, but the Metro District name is remaining the same as Ramuda Ridge. Okay, because they're putting Ramuda Ridge on their exhibits. Correct, because that that's the name Aspen of the Metro Ranch. District, but it encompasses the area of the development known as Aspen Ranch. Got it. All right, and again, this is really going to only affect those who end up living there. Correct. Yeah. Um, and they get a disclosure statement when they do close on their property that they are within a special district boundary, that they have a special assessment that is unique to their property and their development and what those funding mechanisms are. And then those future residents would ultimately have a chance to serve on the Metro District Board and would have a say in their governing governance of that district and how those funds are spent and the de debt is paid off. So, like, closest example would be... Cumberland Green? Cumberland Green, Ventana, Mesa Ridge, Cross Creek. Okay. Metro districts are very common, not only in the region, but across the state. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other? Mr. Geek, do you have a question? Yeah, I got a question on on Kane as you go east from Link. Okay. Is that road going to be done by this? Yes, there will be improvements to Kane. It will be paved with curb gutter and sidewalk up to Crescent Moon, which, Chris, if you can go back a couple of slides. Back of the track. Correct. So at the bottom where, at the bottom right hand corner where it says track day, you can see Crescent Moon is a north south roadway um, that intersects Kane. So Kane Road will be improved along that front, the southern boundary of that frontage, and then um, Crescent Moon will also be improved well, that in addition be to improvements along. all by the. Uh, water that runs through those pastures that are the out. irrigation water so there was a um, soils uh, study subsoils subsurface soils report prepared with Aspen Ranch that evaluated the surface drainage and the irrigation in order to address all of that there is a detention pond located in the tract a which is in the southwest corner of the development that's um, going to help to detain and then release There'll that historic pipes and stuff running. correct there is a significant pipe I believe it's 42 inches that goes right. under Thank link you. So I guess the, the bigger question is going to avoid what we're dealing with up in Darniel oh, as well, best as we can. As best as we can. Right. Um, that's not the sole purpose of the Metro District, but yes. The, no, I know. this. The, the it's, water it's, will be addressed with okay. various engineering techniques. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, right now, no other questions from council. It's a public hearing if anybody has any questions from public on this item. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And unless there's further comments or discussion from council, um, we can make a decision. Tonight, preferably. Uh, Ms. Duncan? The recommendation. That's what you want, the recommendation. Mm -hmm. The motion. The motion, yep. Yeah. In the motion to approve conditionally or deny, we're going to approve, right? Yes. Okay. If that's what you want, let's let just put it that way. Okay. Doing. Yep. So, motion to approve resolution 21-058, approving an amended and restated service plan for the Ramonda Ridge Metropolitan District. Okay. And Mr. Applegate. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second for approval. Uh, please vote. Six yes. Motion carried. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, item number 9C, I'm opening a public hearing to consider the request for a hotel and restaurant liquor license application for Knucklehead 339 LLC located at 412 Royalty Place. Uh, Ms. Huffman. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. The applicant has submitted the application for a hotel and restaurant liquor license for DBA Rooster's Grill and Pizzeria to be located at 412 Royalty Place. All of the fees were submitted with the application. The results of the survey and a map of the survey area and a list of uh, current liquor establishments located within the city have been submitted to council prior to tonight's meeting. 
The police department has been notified of this applications and of this application and they have no concerns at this time. Um, all property publication and posting was uh, completed 10 days prior to this public hearing. We do have the applicants um, in the audience, Mr. Um, P, um, Paul and Heather Frazier, if you have any questions. Okay. Well, it seems pretty straightforward. Any questions from council on this item? Ms. Thompson? I would just like to comment. I introduced myself to them because I go around the audience quite frequently and introduce myself to people. And so I did find out who they were before the meeting and I did ask them two questions and I want to make those questions public. I asked them if it was going to be Coke or Pepsi. I'm happy to report it's Coke. And then I asked them if they were going to have gluten-free items on their menu because I have to eat gluten-free. So I'm just disclosing those two questions for you. Oh, okay. Thank so. you. Okay. Um, it is a public hearing. Any questions, comments, concerns on this item? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And if there's no further discussion, how would council like to move forward on this item? Mr. Geek? I make a motion to approve. And Ms. Estes? Second. Ms. Duncan, do you have anything? No. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval. Uh, the um, license, please vote. <laughs> Six yes, motion carried. All right, thank you and congratulations and good luck. Yep. All right, item number 9D, resolution 21-059, a resolution adopting City of Fountain Water Master Plan 2021. Uh, says Mr. Fink by seeing Mr. Blankenship walking up. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to make a couple really brief uh, introductory uh, comments before I hand the mic over uh, to Mike Fink to do the presentation. Uh, just wanted to reiterate from uh, uh, our most recent presentation that our goal is to educate the council so that each of you have a good understanding uh, of the various components of the water system, the current status of each of those components of the water system, uh, the purpose of the, the plan, and, and the critical points. Uh, Mike will cover each one of those. And yes, it is raining outside. That's what that, n n yeah. Is that a, is that a Right on cue, yeah, no. I haven't, uh, yeah, I wish I could take credit for that. Um, as far as the council's role this evening, we're asking you to consider adoption of the master plan. Uh, and if you do adopt this master plan, we will move forward uh, with publishing the final document, uh, move forward with implementation, uh, including the form. Uh, formal implementation plan, uh, proceeding with the balancing of the uh, uh, the supply chain, with the primary focus being on the on, on treated water, um, and we'll begin addressing the policy issues and also the operational items that are identified in in the master plan. So, with that, I will ask uh, our water resources uh, and engineering manager, Mike Fink, to come up and uh, with the presentation, please. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me with this mask on? Not, not that great? Look at that. So, uh, talking to the mic, I think. Can you, oh, can, you, can, you see, can you hear me now? I can hear that. I don't know about audience can. Is this better? Okay. Well, let's try it. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> members of council, Senior staff, members of the public, my name is Michael Fink. I am your water resources manager. And I've been the project manager for the water master plan for the last two years. It's a culmination of a lot of work by a lot of people. Tonight, my goals for you are to first recap the presentations from August 24th and September 28th. We'll go more into depth on water delivery and treated water supply, which Dan identified as one of the most important parts of this. Financing will be discussed in more detail and introduction of some policy topics that will require council decisions in the future will be discussed. At the August 24th council meeting, Katie Helm, the conservation and sustainability manager introduced you to the water master planning process. She noted that this is a comprehensive assessment of supply, treatment, storage, demand, distribution, and financing for our system. It identifies and prioritizes critical needs and determines how we may proactively address these needs. 
At the September 28th meeting four weeks ago, I briefed you on the water demand studies, the raw water supply situation, which is water rights and includes reservoir storage, the treated water supply concerns, the land use planning and water resources planning nexus, and I touched on water system financing and policy considerations that the water master plan has defined. This is the third and final presentation. At the end of the presentation, I will ask for your permission to complete this part of the water plan and to edit the different sections into a more readable report. The water master plan is a projection of the growth of the entire system driven by the increase in water demand. It is not tied to a calendar schedule. The water plan is directional, not decisional. Following up adoption, updates to council and the document will continue as we assess progress. Execution of initiatives driven by water demand, not a timeline. timeline. However, we will be revisiting the water master plan and bring it back to you on a regular basis, thinking two years uh, as we go forward. So we're going to start at the very bottom of the, bot of the glass of water there and move from there. Let's see. One of these works. Could you advance it, please? <laughs> Starting with demand. Fountain's, current, Fountain's water demand is defined in several ways. The current annual water demand is 3,167 acre feet. That's what we, we took last year, almost a billion gallons. But for completely building out the fountain service area, the projected an annual demand is 11,527 acre feet or almost 4 billion gallons, an increase fourfold over what we actually delivered last year. Now the annual water demand is important because it's, it's a criterion used to plan for water rights, raw water supply, and raw water storage. The current average daily demand is about 2.8 million gallons. So that's, three, that's uh, 1 billion gallons divided by 365 days. The, this works out to between 80 and 95 gallons per person per day. The maximum daily demand, okay, in the hot days, last year it was on July 2nd, last year it was 5.32 million gallons. And that, that reflects a peaking factor over the average of about 1.9. The peak hourly demand that day was at six in the morning and we punched out 350,000 gallons in less than an hour, which reflects a peaking factor over the, over the peak day of 1.57. Now these numbers are important because the maximum day and peak hour demand are the criteria to design the treatment capacity, the treated water storage, and the distribution system along with fire flow. For completely building out the fountain service area, the projected average daily demand is 10.3 million gallons. So that's about Five, four, four times the, uh, the peak day that we have right now. For completely building out the service area, the maximum daily demand, the maximum daily demand is 19.55, which is about four times what we put out on the maximum day last year. So we're looking at the ultimate build out of our system requiring four times as much water as we have now. Let's see. Supply. Fancy that. It works. Oh, you did it. Okay. I mean, I've, got, I've got something that I've got to cue you up on, though. Found water supply, raw, untreated water, varies as to climatic conditions, and varies as to the Interstate Compact Administration for the water imported from the Colorado River. Fountain has no control over these variables. So the water supply section of the master plan, our consultants analyze water rights yield given three climatic conditions. 
dry year yield, average year yield, and wet year yield. We also looked at an anal analysis of the water rights yield under three imported water conditions. No change to the imported water. Um, uh, so business as usual, a moderate reduction in imported water from Colorado River. So we would only receive about 70% of what we normally re receive. And then a very severe reduction in imported water where we receive less than half the water we normally receive. Water storage mitigates the effects of curtailment and varying yield due to climatic conditions. Our largest storage is in the Pueblo Reservoir. We have three storage accounts with a total available volume of 11,261 acre feet. Right now we have about 7,700 acre feet in there, which is roughly twice uh, our annual demand. So we have a goal of maintaining at least two years of supply in Pueblo Reservoir. This means when we finally get to build out, we'll need 23,000 acre feet of raw storage at total build out. Where will Fountain find that additional storage? In 2008, Fountain purchased the Lafarge, later the Martin Marietta gravel pit on the southwest side of the city. We are cur currently performing a diligence review to begin the process of developing the site for reservoir storage, both for raw water to be treated and for water to be exchanged into Pueblo Reservoir. Next, please. Thank you. This matrix defines the water right yields fully developed in three different climatic conditions. Punch one, please. Okay, the dry yield, punch two, an average yield, and a wet year yield, punch three. So these are all an acre feet that would yield in a year, acre feet per year, on the water rights we already have, fully developed. We also analyzed this under the three different climatic conditions, so punch one, please. With no reduction in imported water from the Colorado Basin, Punch two, a moderate reduction, roughly 70% of what we normally get. And punch three, a severe reduction, less than half what we normally get. Now, the good news here is the most restrictive of the nine uh, matrix, matrix boxes, and it's not where Paul Lind was said, uh, is in the lower left. Punch, please. The yield that we have right now it would be 4,807 acre feet, or one and a half times our annual demand right now. So we're in relatively good shape on water rights. We will still have to buy water rights. So this again assumes that water rights are all fully developed and yield the maximum amount during each of the specified conditions. Let's move on to the next one, water master plan delivery. This is the nuts and bolts the pipes and fire hydrants and treatment and, and storage. On an annual basis right now, the treated water supply can satisfy the annual demand, about a billion gallons a year. Again, the average daily demand is about 2.8 million gallons each day. Fountain is coming to the ceiling on the treated water supply to satisfy the maximum daily demand. This is the most critical and most limiting of all the elements of our water master planning. On a peak day, we can deliver 6.18 million gallons. We have in the past. Maintaining this delivery and the peak hour demand are limiting factors. For completely building out fountain service area, our annual, our average daily demand, average daily demand is 10.3 million gallons. And the complete build out on the maximum day is 19.5. So we, we try to match demand to supply. As demand rises, supply must actually lead it. Treated, treatment treated water storage and distribution systems are designed to deliver the maximum day supply. With increasing demand predicted, found, Fountain will need to increase treated water production and storage relatively soon. 
as the average daily and the peak daily demands increase. As with the raw water component, water storage can partially mitigate this constraint. The fountain has just less than 8 million gallons in treated water storage. It's more than one, a one day supply on a peak day if all the tanks are topped off. Additional water storage will be required relatively soon. The draft technical memorandum prepared by Black and Veatch recommends an additional 2.5 million gallons of treated water storage. Let's move to the next slide. This is a slide repeated from four weeks ago. And this is Fountain's water service area in pink. And there's a lot of empty pink up there. To the north of us, we have an IGA with Widefield as to which side of the line we serve and which side Widefield serves. Uh, the interesting thing about Fountain is that there are five water providers within the city. We're only one. So we're only planning for ourselves. Uh, the existing water distribution system is shown in blue, and it's clustered around what is now developed in Fountain. Advance it, please, Chris. Thank you. In red, what you see here is how we get to deliver almost 4 billion gallons. And these are just the big pipes. These are the main transmission and distribution lines. These are not the network of of small distribution neighborhoods. So this is a lot of infrastructure to put in the ground, and that's what we are serving. That's how we will serve 3.75 billion gallons per year. Next slide, please. Where will this additional treated water come from? We have five current opportunities that we're looking at, and the first one is to, con to design and construct a separate supply main from Colorado Springs to Fountain to have a direct connection for our SDS water. Currently, our southern delivery water is delivered through the Fountain Valley Authority. This would provide a, uh, a level of redundancy that we do not have right now. We are very dependent upon the Fountain Valley Authority wa uh, water system. The second opportunity we've been working on for about 12 years is a cooperative South County, South El Paso County Pier Water Suppliers Group to construct a new surface water treatment plant. It's called WARA, W-A-R-A. We regularly meet with the partners to move this project forward through design and permitting. WARA, the Widefield Aquifer Recharge Association, is fountain, widefield, and security in equal thirds. We're working to develop a diversion from Fountain Creek to a common treatment plant and then inject that treated water into the Widefield Aquifer, which would act as a reservoir with zero evaporative losses. The treated water would be pumped out of the aquifer, final treated, and the utilities would deliver it to their customers. The third potential is a new surface water treatment plant at the Fountain Reservoir, which is the old Lafarge Reservoir. In the 2007 Water Master Plan, that was basically Plan B. Uh, we decided to, to go with Plan A, which was SDS, from that master plan. But that doesn't make this any less viable. This would be developed with the, with the Fountain Reservoir development. And the reservoir is listed in the Arkansas Basin Implementation Plan which qualifies this project for potential funding opportunities. Our fourth opportunity, and it's just popped up in the last several months, uh, is to participate with the northern water suppliers in what they call the loop system. What we would have here is the Chilcot Ditch, which is a diversion off the Chilcot the, to channel Fountain Creek water to a reservoir and treatment plant south and east of Fountain. Fountain already has uh, water rights in the Chilcot Ditch. I sit on the board of directors of the Chilcot Ditch. Uh, we also have what they call foreign water going down the Chilcot Ditch under a carriage agreement. So we can already bring water to this site. And the positive thing about this site is with a treatment plant there, we have treated water where our biggest growth area is, which is difficult now because our treated water is all uh, coming through, most, mostly coming through the Fountain Valley line. And the final pot potential is something 
that came out of the uh, out of the Air Force perfluorinated compounds solution. We have two granular activated treatment plants that the Air Force supplied. They transferred ownership of those to us two years ago. These facilities will be supplanted when the new ion exchange treatment system comes online in 2022. And we could move these to strategic places where we have wells that are closer to the demand centers. All five of these water supply scenarios have positive and negative connotations and considerations. Some are easier to permit, some are quicker to build, but maybe more than one will be affected as we go forward. Next slide, please. The water master plan, uh, land use planning congruence with water resources plan. The water staff and our consultants worked with the planning division to define the water demand data that were presented to you four weeks ago and earlier tonight. These data were foundational to the conclusions about demand growth, and as I keep saying, the water master plan is demand driven. About 40% of all water use in fountain is exterior, and irrigation of landscaping is the largest contributing factor to peak day calculation. Fountain currently has landscaping requirements for commercial developments embedded in codes and regulations, but none for residential developments. To encourage sustainable, attractive, and functional landscapes that not only support the water needs of new developments, but are affordable and implementable in existing mature neighborhoods, as well as available to existing commercial properties, a more structured and codified set of landscape requirements is necessary. The planning division and the conservation and sustainability manager are currently working towards defining and developing a more comprehensive landscaping set of codes. These will be developed and brought to council for redu review, adoption, and implementation. Next slide, please. Financial topics were coupled with policy topics at the last presentation, and they go hand in hand in many cases. Every two years, the council addresses a two-year water fund budget. The budget you approved earlier tonight comprehensively defined projected income and projected expenses for the water utility in the 2022 water year, or budget year. So you will, you see this every year, you see it in depth every two years. This is a much larger overview. The financial topics that the water master plan defines will inform the utility staff as we prepare the next two year budget but the master plan also addresses longer term financial topics. However, the water plan is not a rate case. The water fund has not instituted a water rate case since 2019, and we've not had a water rate increase since 2020. Water rate cases are rigorous financial efforts that usually are about six months of intense financial study, culminating in recommendations for revisions of rates and tariffs that require council action. Some financial topics that could be part of a future water rate case include the possible development of an irrigation only water tap fee and possibly an irrigation only water rate. Possible adoption of a water budgeting rate option for customers. This would be an opt-in, a special tariff that would, that would encourage uh, individual customers to manage their water wisely on their own property. And looking at revisions to the entire current TAP fee schedule. Next, please. Water master plan that I presented to you four weeks ago had over 60 policy considerations identified. These will all be addressed on separate timelines, some sooner rather than later. Some of these policy considerations actually contradict each other. Many of these policy considerations have financial elements that may require additional expenses or may generate additional revenues. Some of the policy considerations are customer facing, some are entirely internal. Some of these policy considerations may, ado may be adopted administratively by the utility director, but many will require action by city council. Some policy considerations may not be implemented at all. Some of the things that we are looking at, proposing large irrigators that currently uh, irrigate with treated water 
to move to irrigating with untreated groundwater as an incentive-driven initiative. The water scarcity response plan was mentioned in September 28th presentation. This is updating the 2013 drought plan to respond to both short-term challenges. These would be like several high demand, hot dry days in sequence that strain the water system or a multi-day interruption of the Fountain Valley Authority, but also looking at long-term events such as extended Trans Mountain water curtailment or water contamination. Looking at defining a consistent policy for development driven infrastructure to be funded by the developers. We're looking at updating the commercial landscaping standards and adoption of some residential landscaping standards. We need confirmation from council to continue restricting water sales to customers within the water service area. Right now, the water uh, code says, and regulation says we uh, furnish water within the city. But as I said, there are five different water utilities within the city. We don't furnish water to places where other people furnish water. One of the first policy decisions to come will come before you later this evening, whether to continue participating in the recovery of yield reservoir land purchase design and construction, or whether use, to use a different method to address water exchanges into Pueblo Reservoir. My final comments for this presentation are, for water demand, next slide please. For water demand, Fountain has analyzed the total build out for Fountain's water service area and we've defined the total demand for water that the city will need through build out. This is foundational to structure the other elements of the water master plan. And we have developed good data. It is not calendar dependent. The demand will come when the demand comes. For water supply, Fountain has built a strong and resilient water rights portfolio and a raw water storage plan that will serve us well. We'll need additional water rights and additional storage, but not until we have more than doubled our water demand. Water delivery, and I continue to flag that in red, is coming to the end of the cupboard. Investment in additional delivery and redundant delivery systems for water treatment, treated water transmission and delivery, and treated water storage will be needed in the near term. The land use congruence with the water resource planning is an example of internal management that I feel is working very well. Many other utilities are not as lucky to be able to have this kind of a relationship as we have in a home rule city. Financing will always be a challenge. Investment in both existing infrastructure and in infrastructure to serve new development will be necessary. Working with other departments such as the bond refinancing that John Lewis brought to you several uh, weeks ago and the continued insistence that development is not a burden our ratepayers bear, our efforts to manage both the big financial items and the smaller ones. Policies will be bought, brought to the, to the council, I'm sorry, uh, policies will be brought to the council by utility staff to support all of these other topics. Proposed policies, revisions to existing policies, and yes, even a doing away with old policies are all part of moving to the future with management and governance support. One thing I hadn't spoken bo about before is the operational end of it. These are considered in the water master plan. What will our workforce look like? What new skill sets will be, de will be developed, need to be developed if our personnel are managing a large reservoir managing multiple water treatment uh, facilities while still managing our distribution system? Can we streamline project delivery and improve cost effectiveness by self-performing selected capital projects? As we close, and I invite additional questions, I would like to ask the council to consider p positive action on the resolution presented to you tonight. And remind you again, your adoption of this master plan does not approve or endorse any of the recommended actions or any of the policy considerations. Your adoption confirms that this plan is your guide to the utility staff as we move forward to better serve our water customers and our community. Thank you all for your time and I'm available for questions. Several members of the, uh, the water master plan committee are also here that they might be able to answer questions that I can't.
Okay. Thank you, Mike, um, for all the information and um, getting us to this point. It's uh, and I. It, been reiterating this a lot it's just uh, important that we are in a good place water wise and um, you know we it's one of those things I'm, I'm fearful that um, whatever happens regionally I'm talking more on the national scale of, of where we are um, that you know things could occur that could really undermine what we're trying to accomplish or, or even provide because um, we're a really tiny fish in that big, big tank and um, don't have a lot of influence in a lot of things So um, when it comes to that big tank again. So uh, I appreciate all the work everyone's put into this, um, Dan and, and the whole entire group uh, moving us here. I know it's been, a, what, 20 years almost? Um, 2007 was the date on the last one. Okay, I thought it was a lot further than that. But in uh, um, just getting us, you know, updated and, and moving here so um, I'm gonna look to council if there's any questions from council miss Thompson yeah I got a couple of questions um, I don't know if you, you have your book up there because I wrote down page numbers okay in section 3 on page 1 mm -hmm. um, and you did mention this briefly it's a very last uh, sentence or two in the bottom paragraph some of the policy considerations will be adopted administratively by the utilities director, but many will require action by the city council. Could, could you or Dan give me an example of a policy that would be adopted by the administrator? Uh, a, a policy that would be adopted by the administrator would be a revision of the water um, design and construction specifications. Okay, thank you. Okay. So major things like landscaping changes and things no, the, like that would, the, would come we, we have We have a set of plans and specs that we publish and update about every five years. Uh, at one time it was adopted by ordinance, but you know, within it we've, we can do bulletins for single items at, at any given time, uh, or we could do a complete reissue still uh, since we revised the utility regulations that would go out under the signature of the, of the utility director okay i was just i was thinking about some of the concerns i brought up last meeting where yes. it could be you know prohibitively expensive to remodel an existing building now that, so those would be the policies that would be made by council not administrative anything that would have uh have to do with I think anything that they would, would, would actually have the effect of amending or creating a new ordinance would have to come to council. Okay. And um, uh, section four, um, there's a cut on page two. And then the, the same question also is going to go with section seven, page four. But it talks at one point, and I really appreciate the fact when it, it talks about landscaping requirements that you considering an incentive program. I always appreciate anything that's an incentive and not a mandate. Um, mandates tend to backfire when things come down from the top. So if we can do incentive programs, I, I really appreciate that. But it did- Council Thompson, we already have one, is called um, grass to garden. Right, yeah, great example. Yeah, and, and I was telling somebody about that the other day and they were really disappointed it wasn't available anymore, so maybe next year. But um, anyways, one of the things it says in here is that you might consider um, uh, drilling some new wells in certain places for non-potable water. Initially, we'd be looking to the large irrigators that currently use potable water right. to irrigate ball fields and parks. Um, the city is one of the biggest, by the way, uh, although we do have a city park that is, is uh, irrigated by a okay, well non pot. That, yeah, but my question is if we're going to if we potentially could be drilling a new well to start using that non potable water, which I think is a great idea. Um, we've been struggling with this PFAS issue for a few years. So I'm going to assume but I don't want to assume that those wells would be tested for PFAS because we sure don't want to be watering our ballparks or fields with contaminating them again well, with more PFAS. Well, certainly. Okay, so those would be tested. Yes. And and mitigated if anything was found and, there. The wells that currently are uh, irrigating under this, both the wells that we own and the wells that we augment under, uh, under contracts that were approved by council, 
uh, like Cumberland Green or the Aragon School. Those have been tested, and they've, they're below the... Uh, right. The, we didn't uh, the well. new wells would be tested also. The new wells would be tested also, yes. Okay, thank you. But otherwise, this is a good document, but thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Geek? Mike, I was wondering, when you say in the near, ter near term, when, what does that mean? We... How many years are we speaking here? If you look at... Um, an average 150 new starts, new housing starts a year. We're looking at five to eight years. Uh, Dan, does that sound about right to you? With regard to to the new a new treated water uh, influx. I think that's what. Well, if if you only had 150 starts a year yeah I don't, that that's what we anticipate as far as uh, new demand but once again that's something that we can't predict right um, but one of the things that we will do uh, if this plan is adopted is to to immediately start working on a formal implementation plan while we concurrently uh, continue with the implementation of the plan we're not going to do that linearly uh, we're going to do that more um, more vertically or kind of in a pancake type situation okay so then the customers that are already on water now are they going to pay for that or the people that are coming in or these new developments are going to be paying for that that was one of the policies to uh have a very uh have, have a very defined method for new development to pay all of the costs and not make that uh not assign that cost to the existing customers. Okay, because I know that we've been trying to keep the water rates as we don't want to hit them with a big bill. So I, I just want to make sure that that happens, that we, no matter how bad things get, we're going to try and keep it, the water rate down like we've been doing the last few years. Absolutely. We, uh, what, what we, in fact, we broke the plan down into multiple scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is the improvements that will be needed to basically uh, maintain uh, the operation of the system for the existing, uh, existing customers. And so any of those improvements that we need to make uh, to, main, to keep that service, to sustain that service, those, are, those costs would be the, the applied to uh, the rates which we charge our existing customers because those improvements would benefit uh, the existing customers, but uh, expansion of this of the system to benefit new customers, then yes, we would uh, uh, th those costs would be applied to uh, those new customers. All right, thank you. All right, any further questions, from Council? At this point, all right. Um, I want to open it up to anybody else who has questions on the water plan. And where we're headed. Okay. Um, so at this point, again, we're we're adopting possibly a water plan that's going to really set the tone for the future uh, council and um, the department in in figuring out how we're going to um, address and and keep care of our water system. Over the next few years, hopefully not 14 years, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so with that, um, this isn't a public hearing, so I don't have to close it. Uh, what would council like to do, Ms. Duncan? I move to approve resolution 21-059, adopting water master plan 2021. All right, and Ms. Estes. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval of our new water plan, please vote. Six yes. Motion carried. All right. Thanks again to everybody for all the hard work. All right. Um, are we okay to keep plugging away? Okay. Item E, resolution 21-060, a resolution concluding fountains further participation in the Haynes Creek Reservoir Project. 
Uh, says Mr. Blankenship. Um, uh, Mike Fink will make the presentation, uh, and then I will follow him up with the uh, recommendation and some comments prior okay. to the recommendation. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fink. The recovery of yield project dates to the City of Pueblo's Recreational and Stream Flow Decree for the kayak run running through the city, and this was decreed in 2006. The kayak run and the historic Arkansas River Park project in Pueblo are termed recreational in-channel diversions, RICDs. This is a non-consumptive water right that the water is used but not depleted by implementing the use. While the water is not consumed, the water right must not be impaired or reduced by other users with decrees for the same reach of the river. Another water user who removes water for another use cannot leave the RICD unable to exercise its minimum recreational flow in that reach. An exchange which moves water out of that reach of the river could cause such an injury. Part of Pueblo's degree was uh, an, a stipulation that allowed the five water uh, utilities, Pueblo Board of Water Works, Aurora, Colorado Springs, Fountain, and Southeastern, to recover the yield, which is recover the yield, ROY, uh, of any exchanges that were curtailed by the operation of the recreational flow right. While the city of Pueblo signed the IGA, hence it's referred to as a six-party IGA, they are, in effect, the calling entity for these curtailments. The five water users ha all have exchange degrees, decrees, including Fountain, that could be affected by the city of Pueblo operating its RICD. These water users formed the Roy Technical Group, I was our representative, I, ha I am our representative for the last 14 years. The Pueblo West Metro District joined the Roy Technical Group later, and I have been uh, our, our re representative all this time. The charge to the Roy Technical Group was to search and find a site to locate a reservoir to recover these foregone curtailed exchange volumes to hold these waters until the exchange curtailment is lifted so that the water that was not exchanged could be exchanged into the Pueblo Reservoir. First, first punch, please. That's the Pueblo Reservoir. We are up here. And Aurora negotiated a storage agreement. Next, next punch, please. This is where the proposed reservoir is going to go. Now the final one. Aurora, 17 years ago, negotiated a, an exchange uh, agreement with the Holbrook Canal and Reservoir Company outside of Ordway. Uh, this was a renewable five-year term storage lease and uh, council authorized this 17 years ago. Um, so we could have used that reservoir to recover our yield in all these years. We have not. Uh, we have not had any exchanges that have been curtailed by the city of Pueblo operating their RICD. So we've not used uh, the, the Holbrook Reservoir at all. Although we had the op opportunity to access that storage. From 2007 through 2020, the Roy Technical Group sibbed through multiple potential sites for a Roy Reservoir, beginning with a long list, narrowing it down to a short list, and finally arriving at consensus decision to look deeply into the Haynes Creek site which is in eastern Pueblo County, north of the main stem of the Arkansas River and south of the Colorado Canal. All the Roy partners have shares in the Colorado Canal Company, including Fountain. The Roy Group sponsored a phase one environmental review performed by RJH. This phase one was completed and showed no fatal flaws. RJH's contract was extended to move into a more into the schematic design and the engineer's opinion of probable cost. Uh, each Roy partner reimbursed Colorado Springs who held RJH's contract for these services. At the same time, the Portable Board of Water Works negotiated an option to purchase the property with a five-year term. This option ends December 31st this year. Option payments are allocated based on the Roy partner's assigned percentage of interest. Fountains is 4.76%. Our annual payments during this five-year option pay pay period have been $7,140 a year. In June, the Roy Technical Committee met and discussed the Haynes Creek site, noting that the option to purchase was set to expire in 18 months. The purchase price is $2.8 million. 
due by that date. Fountain share is $133,280. It was decided to meet later when more detailed estimates were available. The most recent comprehensive cost estimates were from November 2019, uh, and they had three different configurations ranging from 5,000 acre feet to 6,100 acre feet for the Haynes Creek Reservoir, um, and costs ranging from 49 million to 55 million. Based on Fountain's percentage of allocation of this project, and if these figures are still valid, we could expect our participation to be about two and a half million dollars for construction. The Roy Technical Group then decided the technical group had fulfilled its purpose. The next step would be to form an entity to actually purchase, design, permit, and construct the Haynes Creek Reservoir. The Roy Technical Group convened a meeting in principles. Basically, we brought our bosses in. Um, where each technical group representative, after briefing their principal, would outline the project and put the next steps in the hands of the principal. Dan Blankenship and I attended this meeting with Taylor Murphy. Maintaining the membership in this technical group has given us the opportunity to participate in this project. But after the master plan studies, in a, one of the recommendations um, from one of our consultants, Wheeler and Associates, Fountain Utilities recommends it is more optimal to develop the Martin Marietta gravel pit that Fountain purchased in 2007 as a multi-purpose reservoir. The Fountain Reservoir may be used for water exchange management as well as for water, raw water storage. I confirmed with Wheeler and Associates, who also manage our, uh, all of our exchanges, that Fountain has never had a prospective exchange into Pueblo Reservoir curtailed in the history of operating any of our exchanges by the flow management constraints of Pueblo's RICD. We're usually uh, shut out by much more senior rights than that. Fountain will continue to operate our water rates in accordance with the flow management requirements of the six-party IGA and the Arkansas River Flow Management Program. Uh, we also will continue to participate on the Roy Technical Group because this may not be the only or the last Roy Reservoir uh, that comes uh, to fruition as we go forward. This is the long game. This is not tomorrow. The attorneys have prepared an agreement to purchase the property. Fountain Re Utilities re recommends that the City Council not move forward in participating in the purchase and the development of this reservoir. So I'm going to hand it off to Dan. Thanks, Mike, and thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments. Um, uh, as Mike indicated earlier, this is really officially the first policy decision that we're asking you to make um, after the master plan. And, and so uh, when, when we look at uh, a, any policy decision, we, we're going to reflect back on the master plan. And when we look at uh, that and and I'm going to talk in terms of our supply chain, our our water supply chain, and uh, and our weakest link in our water supply chain is is water delivery, specifically treated water. You just heard Mike talk about that. What you're considering or what we're asking you to consider this evening uh, is a water exchange management part of the water supply uh, link, not necessarily the the treated water or water delivery link. So mo no matter what action you take tonight, it, it won't have a direct impact on, on our water delivery link. It won't strengthen that weakest link that, that we have. Um, that said, I, I believe that it's staff's responsibility to provide you all with the information that's necessary for you to make an educated decision. In this situation, we have not provided uh, alternatives to the staff's uh, recommended uh, action. Uh, but because we are bumping up on the decision deadline, we have to notify uh, our partners by November 1st. I feel like I need to provide you with an alternative to the staff's recommendation and share with you the expected outcomes of such a decision. If the decision, if you, the staff's recommendation is, is to not, uh, not proceed, but the alternative decision would be to, uh, 
to, to proceed or to continue with the project. And, and, and if we do continue with the project, the city will be obligated to purchase our share of the property, as Mike indicated, which is approximately $133,000. We will also then be obligated to pay continued costs for the development of the reservoir uh, site, including construction, which our share would be approximately, Esther estimated this time, to be $2.5 million. However, however, the Roy Partnership Agreement provides an off-ramp for us, so, and it enables any partner to sell their portion of the ownership at any time moving forward, thus terminating any further obligation. So if you, uh, if you feel like tonight that you don't have enough information to make the decision to no longer participate, then I would, I would recommend that you make the motion to continue to participate. Uh, for your convenience, I have, uh, I have put both of these uh, alternative motions down on paper. Um, and so essentially, it, it's a policy decision. And I'll, and I'll bring these up for you. Thank you. And so once again, the, the, the staff recommends that the city not participate further in the purchase or the development of the Haynes Creek site for Roy uh, Reservoir purposes. Uh, Mike has explained that uh, this evening, but like I say, once again, we're bumping up on a, on a deadline, so we don't really have an opportunity to, to discuss this beyond the, this evening. And therefore, given that's the, the situation that we're in, I, I feel that uh, you know it's appropriate to provide you with the alternatives uh, and what the uh, outcomes will be with the, the, the two different alternatives. So essentially what we're asking from you this evening is a, a affirmative direction to either proceed or not to proceed. And those are the two alternatives that, we, that I've just presented to you. So at this point, uh, both Mike and I would be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Okay, Ms. Thompson. Oh, no, I do have some questions because I and, and Dan, you know, and I've shared with Scott some of my concerns and I've really vacillated back and forth with this and, and even my own understanding of how does this affect the pit and the possibility of that treatment and and where does this fit in our um, and I think Scott used the term for me um, portfolio of water. Right. And uh, my largest concern as we move forward past this um, past the pit is. I don't feel like or see that we're building our portfolio that we need to be. Um, and when I know other entities are out there still looking for water, still doing those things, I don't, I've not got the sense that we're doing that either. Um, I, I'm concerned that we don't have, um, enough in this game to, to keep us moving. I, um, I get the whole point about it's going to cost some money, but at the same time, I, for the safety of where, where we're at with water, I'm, I'm concerned that we're, we're jumping out of this too late. Um, I think, unfortunately, this is occurring right after the master plan. Um, I wish there could have been more discussion around Haynes. Again, I've vacillated back and forth as to what I wanted, uh, how we want to proceed forward on this. Um, I personally don't see us getting out now as a, as a great idea. Um, just in what everything's going on in the region um, in water. Um, I hear that it's not going to really be detrimental if we don't be a part of this, but at the same time, um, what would it hurt to be a part of it um, outside of the, the expenses it's going to incur um, to be a part of it? I, and, I, and again, I, I know there's a lot of different pieces. The, the water treatment, the, the other, right. the, even the things you spoke about. Um, but when I look at, and I use this a term when I was trying to um, kind of get clarity from Scott, was when I'm looking at my retirement, I'm putting money as much as I can to build as much of a retirement as I can because I want to live comfortably. And that's how I see this, and I want to make sure that we're um, putting all of our um, eggs in as much of the baskets as we can so that we're, we're safe and we're, we're ready to go. Um, uh, I, I don't get the sense that we're fully 
in with the pit. I mean, I, I think we're on a good trajectory and, and and we're in a good place. And I think that's a great thing that we're going to be able to do. Um, but for me, until then, until some other things have been worked out, I don't want to really just jump out of this at this time. Um, if the new council can have an opportunity to look more into this and and figure that nope, he was wrong, and and uh, then 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 jump out at that time, as as you stated, um, we can really get out any time and and really no penalty other than what we spent on it, but we can sell our our portion out of out of out of if, out of it. Yeah, if, and if and if unfortunately, you know, with a lot of policy decisions, there is no wrong or right. Okay. Um, you know, and, and so that's, uh, you know, I, I really felt compelled to, to share with you what the outcomes would be, you know, if we do proceed. And, and you are absolutely right, Mayor, that uh, we, you know, as I indicated, the, the MOU provides for uh, an off-ramp, which is our ability to, to sell our portion. So obviously the deeper we get in, we're going to incur more costs, but at least initially, you know, the, the initial cost would be the ad additional 133,000 plus to proceed with the purchase, uh, of which, you know, then we would be able to recover maybe all of that or a portion of that, or maybe even more than that, depending on what the value of that portion becomes as we move forward. And I guess the other thing to consider, and I, and, and I may have not heard, so I'm going to be upfront with that in full transparency, what are the benefits of us staying with it? Because um, I've heard, and, and you're, you're trying to get us to a point of just not to be a part of it, and I get that, um, but what, what's the bad in staying with it? And, and I think for, for me, I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of that that convinces me that this is a great idea you want to, um, to jump that? out of this. Um, and kill our portfolio, I guess, is what I'm seeing or saying, if that makes sense. So the reason, the way the exchange works is when the city of Pueblo is running the kayak run and the harp, um, no one, none of the signatures to the six party IGA can uh, exchange water, which means that they actually take water out of that reach. Uh, and the, the dam quits releasing water because they are saying we're bringing water into it. It's a paper transfer, but so the water would flow all the way down to this reservoir and be held in that reservoir until the curtailment period is over. Then the water there would be water being released from the reservoir that could be exchanged against. So that water that would be released from the reservoir would suddenly get a little bit less and this water would be released here so that the water being released from the reservoir makes that stretch of the river whole. That's how the exchanges work. So as I said, we have never been in the position where we needed to, where we needed to save this curtailed water this would give us the opportunity. The Holbrook has given us, us that opportunity for the last 17 years, but we've never used it. We've never had to. We've been able to, to move our water differently. As we grow, as we use, instead of 1 billion gallons of water a year, we use 4 billion gallons of water a year. There will be more water that has to be moved then something like that might be necessary. As it is, we do have that opportunity, but we also have the, the opportunity to exchange water into, punch the last one, please, the fountain reservoir, and use that as a return, a return flow and other surface water that's not used for other reasons, and pay that back in and then our short exchange would be from this point to this point. And we already have that in all of our, in all of our uh, water rights decrees. So are we, are we shutting ourselves out completely by not using this? As I said, this may not be the last Roy Reservoir. There's still opportunities there. There are also other reservoirs right at the at the confluence of Fountain Creek and the Arkansas River 
uh, one of which is owned by TriView, and they've given us, us an offer sheet to store water in it. So there are other opportunities that we could pursue beyond this, or in addition to this. Did that answer? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a clear-cut, like I say, it's not a, a, a clear-cut uh, answer. It, is it, you know, really, it, we're making a, uh, a subjective determination of what's in the best interest of our customers in the long term. And, you know, we've made an analysis of that, and we recognize that, you know, that it is, it is subjective. Uh, and, and when you get into any type of subjective situation, there's opinion uh, associated with that. Um, and we recognize that, you know, our opinion is not the only opinion. And quite frankly, um, when it comes to setting the policy, your opinion is what really matters here. So our, our, I feel that our, you know, our position was to make the recommendation, share additional information, give you an alternative that if you feel that is the best direction to go, then either, either direction that you choose to go, we will implement. Um, that is that's that's where our where our where our, what we're here for is to provide the information, provide our thoughts, uh, and then ultimately to implement you know uh, your policy direction. Mr. Applegate. Yeah, in there in some of the reading, it it pointed out that the fountain reservoir would be a little more efficient than that due to loss down that direction. And the one million, whatever it was, to do that, would that slow down the development of the fountain reservoir as money becomes not available for that now? That becomes <coughs> the, the second part of your question is that that becomes a, a one of those finance things that you know making a decision on where to apply most uh, efficiently the money that we do have. Right. Um, for exchanging from the fountain reservoir to the Pueblo reservoir you would incur transit losses from here to here, about 30 miles. Okay. From exchanging water from the Haynes Creek Reservoir to the Pueblo Reservoir, you would be creating our water here, either from the sewage treatment plants or from unused uh, surface water rights that we have. It would have transit losses all the way down to here and all the way down to here and have it be stored here and incur evaporative losses and then be exchanged back. So you do have larger losses if it were here than if it were here. That assumes if both were working. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ms. Duncan. When you say proposed, do you have a timeline when the Haynes Creek Reservoir versus the Fountain Reservoir will be available? Um, the Roy Technical Group has turned this over to their principals who will appoint different people, at least in the bigger utilities, to do the design and the construction. So no, we don't have a, the, the technical group's task was to, was to find a site. And that's what the technical group did. So once the, uh, once the IGA is signed and the money is forwarded to Pueblo Board of Water Works, who actually hold the option, and the property is purchased, then the uh, permitting comes into play for that, um, for that site, and the design follows the permitting, and the construction follows the design. So I have no idea how long that's going to take. Okay, how much benefit would we get from Haynes Creek compared to Fountain Reservoir as far as volume? We would have, we would have a larger transit loss in getting the water there. So the water that can't be exchanged from here to there incurs more transit loss to here. Uh, just what that is, it's another 30, mi or, yeah, another 30 miles down the main stem of the Arkansas. Okay. Sir. Was the question, if I, if I maybe uh, clarification, I think I heard 
that you were asking, would we have more storage in Fountain or we would have more storage in Haynes? In Haynes, we have a limited amount of storage. In Fountain, we would control the full storage. It'd, it'd be all ours. It'd be all ours. How many yeah. people are involved in Haynes? Six. We, we would Six. So we, oh. We, we own just under, just under 5%. And we already own the land for Fountain Reservoir. Yes, we do. Mm. So that doesn't divide out equally. Who has the majority of the shares there? Uh, 27 and change for Aurora, mm. Colorado Springs, and Pueblo Board of Water Works. 4.76 for Southeastern, Pueblo West, and Fountain. So we have just a little tiny amount, and they're going to vote for anything they want. <laughs> we won't be able to stop anything. Yeah, that's anything what that's that's where I'm going. Yeah, that's where I'm going. So, okay. Hmm. So we're a minority owner. Well, we are, and and I, again, I think that's the way we're always going to be. I, again, for me, it's not so much who controls what in this, because we're you know, the. The fountain pit, I just keep calling it the pit. I mean, that's, that's going to be 100% ours. We have that full control in that. For me, I just don't know that we're far enough down the road on that that I feel comfortable just jumping out of this at the time. Now, again, I, as I stated earlier, if, if maybe we need to jump out later on, and, and these may be two completely different pots of water that we're talking about, and I'm kind of getting that we are. It's just, it's more about the portfolio for me and not so much whether the fountain pit versus this is going to solve our issues. It's, um, it's a portfolio issue for me um, in getting out. So all we have to do now is the $133,000 to purchase the portion of the land that we would own. Correct. If we move. And then uh, after Mike said we, they have to do the study and the permitting and blah, 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 just probably going to take five to six years. But we would have then to pay our when, portion. But of is that, that when we pay the two million? Oh, we have to be paying on those different studies and oh, portions yeah. all along. Absolutely. We, we so would have to continue. We could to very partner. quickly lay out a half a million dollars on um, this. I don't know the magnitude of the dollar amount at this point in time, but we would definitely would come back on a routine basis to advise you of, uh, of that. But yes, as they move forward, uh, the initial step, if you move, uh, if we go ahead and continue with the participation, the initial step would be to uh, go forward with the purchase, which is going to be a little over $133,000. And have the environmental assessments been done on this, that the land is, okay. that the land the is cleared one. for this yeah, phase reservoir? Phase 1 ESA has been completed. I'm sorry? The Phase 1 ESA, environmental, uh, Phase okay. 2 is, uh, is the on-site drilling and things like that, and Phase 3 is remediation if you ever have it. But the Phase 1 was completed under contract, and we did pay 4.76% of that, so. Okay, so this is... The environmental assessments are cleared that this can be built on that property pending anything weird showing up when the drilling is done. Okay. And what's the comparison in cost for what we're going to put there? I mean, rough ballpark. I know you don't know what it is compared well, to what the fountain. We have, a, we have a consultant working on that for us now. Uh, in fact, this is, this is a, a plan that they have prepared, uh, and we're signing a contract with them to, to continue their analysis and development of this, uh, of this concept. The, the one thing about this particular concept is, uh, this is the primary purpose of this is to store raw water and then to treat that raw water to put it into our delivery system so we can create uh, our, our, so we can strengthen, strengthen our weakest link, the, the, the treated water capacity. And so our anticipation is that the, this, the purpose of this is for that, and that would then be paid for as part of uh, the system expansion uh, with, with uh, new customers. Uh, but what this does for no extra cost gives us the ability to, to do these exchanges. So the, the cost of this is going to be X, but to add the ability to do these exchanges to this, there is no additional cost to do that because we, we can accomplish that with this facility as it is intended. Ms. Thompson, go ahead. So in the previous presentation, you gave us several um, 
lists of things that wanted to be done to with internally. If we stay in this project and spend the money on that, um, is that limiting us from being able to work on any of those projects that were on no. that list? No, in fact, our intention is to pursue all because one project will not be the solve all for our, to get to the 19 million uh, gallons, is it 19 okay. million gallons per day on our peak, we're going to need multiple projects um, and, and quite possibly all five of that we had listed and maybe even more. And that's that we're in is my, where my concerns lie. Sure, and that, and that's and that's you know when we're talking about uh, treated water capacity, um, and we're just we just you know like I say we 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 feel like compelled to to share the two alternatives with you and give you as much information as you can to be able to make this subjective decision. And there's no way we can find treated water earlier, like Chilcot Ditch, or somewhere else where we could get supplies to the new developers that are crying for water? One, one of the, uh, one of the uh, alternatives or one of the options, I guess, or one of the items listed in that, in the treated water um, capacity uh, is to, uh, to get a connection to Colorado Springs Utilities, a direct connection to Colorado Springs Utilities. And I have spoken to uh, Colorado Springs Utilities personally uh, and Tomorrow morning, we're going to make a formal request for that, and that's what we're going to call the bridge. Uh, we were hoping to get uh, what I'll call firm capacity uh, out of Colorado Springs, but they really need uh, the long-term firm capacity themselves. But they have expressed to me that they are more than willing to work with us on a bridge, and that's going to be, I think, believe our quickest uh, route to getting the additional treated water capacity and, and and like I say we call it a bridge it gets us from one point to another point and and during that time frame it enables us then to develop projects like the pit um, or other projects like Wara, uh, possibly the the loop is that what it's called? Uh, we're you know we're in the we're in the loop on the loop in the sense that we have asked to go get to the table uh, and at least consider that because we're going to consider every alternative that we can in order to meet our long term needs and that's why we we did the analysis in the master plan. To, to get a firm confirmation of what is our demand going to be to get us to build out. Right. Uh, and that's what we're targeting. And we're targeting it, and we're, we realize that we're going to have to bring these projects online to meet the demand, and, but we don't control that demand. Um, and so we're, we're kind of, I guess, rolling with the flow to the greatest extent that we possibly can. Well, Mike would be our loop to the loop, so. Yeah. <laughs> but the, as far as the water from Colorado Springs Utility, uh, how would that, would that cost us quite a bit? And would there be an easy hookup? Are we close? <laughs> or are we a long ways away? Nothing's from? easy, unfortunately. Right. Um, but, yes, we have talked to them about a couple possibilities coming through their existing distribution system. We've also talked to them there in the process of ex uh, working on an extension of a treated water line from the base plant which is part of the SDS system mm -hmm. down Mark Shuffle uh, that will get part of the way to Fountain and really from uh, that is probably the best all at least initially that appears to be the best alternative because it brings a direct connection from SDS into the eastern part of our, our community um, and so but the details the the devil is in the details I guess as they say and we're we're gonna really we're gonna make the official request Quest tomorrow that we start that process and once again we'll be coming back to you with as we learn more about that and and ultimately making more policy decisions on which is the best direction to go okay miss Duncan so on the Hallbrook Reservoir are we in that alone or who do we share that with the same parties correct same parties it's it's actually yeah, the contract with the Holbrook Reservoir is actually uh, with between the Holbrook Canal and Reservoir Company and uh, Aurora Water. So we are we are sub to Aurora Water. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Yeah, we are the Holbrook Canal and Reservoir Company has a contract for storage with with Aurora Water, okay. and we 
have a contract with Aurora Water. And we, and we pay $4,000 a year for that, and over the last 12 years we have not utilized that. Oh, wow. And that was kind of part of it. But our plan is to continue to <laughs> participate in that. Um, I would suspect, and, and Mike, you can clarify this, that once the, this Roy Reservoir is in place, then would the Holbrook Reservoir, uh, would that lease continue, or, or do you know? I, I don't know. I really don't know. It, it was supposed to, it was part of the requirement within the IGA that we provide a Roy Reservoir. So that was what we did. It's basically a diligence element. Yeah, and as you can see, there's a lot of variables and we're pushed up against this deadline. That's why we're here. I mean, we would love to be able to come to you with much more definite answers on these things. But we've pushed this to the 11th hour and the 59th minute, and now we have to make a decision. Are you gonna have to pay the 133,000 right away? Mm -hmm. Yes, if we, I don't do. November 1? No, no. Uh, no, they need a confirmation by November 1 and the money to follow. Right, and uh, so I don't know the exact timing, but I w we have to, we, I would s suspect that it would probably be within uh, 60 days time frame that we would have to. But once we make the commitment, we're signing on the dotted line and saying that we will pay. It would not. 133. Yes, yes, sir. Is that we're saying we're going to pay all of it as it goes along, or we're going to pay the 130? We're we're going to we're we're committing to the 133 plus additional costs until such time that if we decided to get out, we would sell the property, uh, sell our interest in the property. But until we sell our interest in the property, we are committing to any expenses that our portion of any expenses that would be incurred. So the minimum is 133,000. Right. Yes. There's going to be quite a bit. There will be more, and I can't tell you what the magnitude is. See, once again, here we are. I'm standing here asking you to make a really difficult decision is what, is what it is. Um, and uh, because we don't have a lot of answers, but we, we're, we're up against a deadline uh, to, to purchase this property, and, and, and we have to decide one way or the other. All right, and herein lies the problem, I think. You, you um, are asking us to make a huge, huge policy decision um, that has a lot of facets to um, to what could happen and what ifs. Um, Scott, all right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, in listening to this presentation and the conversation, a couple things really jumped out. Just a couple thoughts I wanted to share. Um, number one, both of these, if you think of them as tools in your toolbox, they're very different kind of tools. I mean, you got one that's a screwdriver that has a very specific purpose, and you have another one that's a little bit of a Leatherman, right? It's got a screwdriver. It can do the screwdriver thing, but it can do some other things as well. The challenge that just came up right here at the end is, is this decision that you have to make, um, which is a challenging one. Well, with both these alternatives, one of these alternatives at option B that Dan threw out there, um, to go ahead and move forward with it, that uh, that leaves the bridge open. That leaves the possibility open, and you can that gives you more time to discuss. It gives you more time to think this through. It gives, frankly, it gives these guys time to get a sense of what what are those studies going to cost, what are the engineering things going to cost, and be able to come back. That preserves your right because when we can turn around and get out get out of it, you can get out of one of these decisions. You can't get out of the other one. It's just a reminder. So if you go with alternative A and say we're done. That's a decision that can't really be undone. Um, if you decide now we're going to keep, we're going to keep our our uh, our toe in the water for a little bit longer, right? We're going to kind of keep that. That's an alternative that you have to spend that money to keep that option open. And at some point, when we determine if it's a go, then we go. If we determine, you know what, it doesn't make sense, the costs are going to be too high, or or really we're far enough now along in the pit design and what we're doing there that we feel even more comfortable about that, then you have a policy call to make then and we can pull ourselves out of it and sell our interest in it. So that's just a thought, um, you know, because you're being pushed up against that time frame, one of these keeps that time frame open a little bit longer or whatever. I think the worth. other part of that, and then we're maybe forgetting is the opportunity to recoup many of those costs that we'll be expending in selling. 
Yeah, we once again, that's another question we can't answer, but it's a possibility right, that right. we could recoup 100% of those costs. It's a possibility. Or we could recoup less. We don't know for sure. Right. And once it, again, and I, you know, I hate being up here not being able to answer these questions. Well, and it's difficult. And, but, and we're not obviously experts on this stuff right. um, up here. But, you know, I and Scott, again, thank you for dumbing it down for us um <laughs> you know you know but yeah and and i want the council to also realize these are two different intents and purposes of the pit versus this in my mind for a long time i've been struggling with um we're not here yet why are we going to get rid of this when they're they're not the same bowl of water however i'm also looking at it as it's a portfolio and we want to keep that as strong as possible. I, I go to my finance guy all the time and, and he's constantly telling me you want to, you want to be diversified and, um, and in, however that means, whatever bulls we're putting our toes in or our spoons or whatever, um, that, that's, that's my concern and, and huh. why I don't feel like it's a good idea to jump out of this at this point. <laughs> Besides that, I'm, water being water, we might make a profit. It, that's at this point in the Any, game. Anything is possible. That's right. Yeah. And the past cost, the cost is of not everything an is going up. Future. What is? What does your financial guy tell you? What's past, that? Past performance is not an indicator of future. Well, not uh, in these. Not in these times. <laughs> yeah. So who? Really, we can't. Right, it would Carl? be pure speculation. But anything's possible. All right, Miss Thompson. I just have one last question. I promise, last one. You came to this at the beginning of the meeting with their, ref with their recommendation from staff to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Can you just, like in two sentences, I mean two sentences, dumb it, down, dumb it down for us, why you're recommended to get out of it initially? Because we, we believe that there will be, we have other opportunities that will uh, be equal to or better than this opportunity. And I guess my question to that is, is made it harder. well, <laughs> my question to that is, 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 are they down the road as far as this, those other opportunities? I, I, I want to, and, and again, we, I don't, I don't want us to go <laughs> off of, we have opportunities right. that we're thinking of and we think they're great right. opportunities, which they probably are, well, but are we on, on as far down the path as we are with this? Um, we are probably not as far down the path with the pit as we are with this, but we have more control over the pit than we have with this. And, so, and what I've had to remind myself yeah. is, is there two different things again, um, and it, and I go back to and I and I'm trying to make this as clear as possible because I'm really pushing this, is, is, uh, is our portfolio and ensuring that we have a stake in water anywhere we can get it. And, and I That's tell you, where I'm at. We, we would not make a recommendation that we, that uh, you know, that that would not that we believe would be that would not be in the best interest of our customers. We 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 always we we take that very seriously, um, but we don't have definite answers. We we you know there's there there we're making some subjective determinations here. Um, Did we have the same kind of an issue over? West here not too long ago, where we had purchased some land property. Oh, in the mountains? Yeah. Oh. That created some help for us. I mean, Curtis was, isn't still we, here, is he? He's yeah, yeah Curtis. Mr. Start Mr. Shaking H20 over there. Ranch is here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but that what that did was that that increased our portfolio of water rights which is obviously a good thing when you look at what Mike presented earlier. You know, we have the water rights now that if we have a dry year and they curtail the, the Colorado River uh, diversions, we're going to have enough water. We're going to have one and a half times the water we need to serve our, our, our customers. So then mm -hmm. to go further into that, mm -hmm. if you stay with what we have here with this, don't do the pit yet, do the other thing and say Aurora needs water and we have it and maybe we don't need it. What this is, what this, what this will do is at times we have to release some of our water in order for 
uh, or we may have to release some of our water in order for the kayakers to do their thing in Pueblo. Um, and then so what we would do is then, then we would capture it into the, 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 the Roy Reservoir and then when there was a window open to transfer it back up into Pueblo, that's what we would do. So it's basically what we're doing here is we're, we're managing water transfers. We're not creating more water rights, and we're not creating more water, we're just managing water. And the other thing is this isn't uh, if or then, like we're, if we go with this, we're going to stop the pit. Pit's going regardless. The pit, yeah, the pit is, the pit's the number, I believe the pit is the number one answer to our uh, long-term uh, water supply, or not water supply, but uh, water, water, treated water, uh, our treated water situation. Okay, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just a quick thought, something I forgot, I meant to mention, forgot to mention, but one of the points Todd made to me earlier when we were discussing this <clears throat> is the fact that we have these relationships with Colorado Springs Utilities, and one of the things that was just mentioned a little bit earlier is the bridge, right, going to them and, and seeking uh, uh, at least a temporary, you know, 20, 25 year connection to them. When you're in a partnership like the one we're talking about here, it's 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 always a good thing. I mean, relationships are huge, and and maintaining that positive relationship here, in a decision that doesn't hurt us or hurt our ratepayers at all, potentially could help us on future collaborative kind of things we're working on, whether it's this bridge or other things. So I, I wanted to mention that too. Does Water have enough money that they can do this yes. and also do the hookup to? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I and I appreciate I appreciate that comment from from Todd because he's obviously looking at this from outside of the forest, and and I can tell you we're really deep in the forest here in utilities. So, <laughs> thank you for the perspective. Okay. Well, I think we're at a point. Does anybody from public want to chime in? <laughs> Okay, uh, you guys know where I stand. Um, I think it's fine if we stay in it. I, I don't think it's going to hurt us um, in the short or long term. I think, in, if anything, it's going to give us a little bit more strength in, in what we have. Um, I'm excited about the pub, the, the pub pit, the, our pit, the fountain pit. Um, and mind you, this whole conversation is coming up because of SDS. Am I right, Mike, that the um, the rafting thing was kind of the reason why it was such a hard sell to, they were afraid we were gonna take flows out of, out of the little run they have there in Pueblo and? They, they actually, uh, City of Pueblo actually got their RICD decreed before, um, before we got the record of decision from the Bureau of Reclamation. So it, they were only peripherally connected. I was around for both of them, so. Yeah, okay. Was, All right, um, if there's no further discussion, where would council like to go with this item? And I, I would stick with either one of the two motions that he handed to us, um, Dan, in uh, either you're for it or, or for staying or not for staying, and I got Miss Duncan. I move to approve continuance of participation in the purchase of Haynes Creek site for Roy Reservoir purposes. Um, Mr. Geek? I second that. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval to stay or continuance in the participation. Um, any further discussion? Please vote. Six yes, motion carried. I thank you for the direction and I apologize for making it so difficult. Thank you. You should. <laughs> um, Troy, in this next one, should we take a break or do you yeah. think we'll be good? A little break. <laughs> Taking a break. He just. <laughs> This is okay. Opioid. This could be a lot. All right, item F, resolution 21-061, authorized and approving the Colorado Opioid Settlement Memorandum of Understanding Related Documents to Effectuate Settlements. And I know you brought this up at our last meeting. I did mention it uh, at our last meeting. Uh, hopefully this one will be a little bit of an easier decision, like I mentioned. Um, so uh, to give a little bit of background, there was a, a class action lawsuit uh, filed uh, nationwide by communities some in Colorado uh, and
and uh, the Attorney General has kind of since taken up the, the mantle of pursuing this action against drug manufacturers for the opioid crisis in America and specifically in Colorado. That, uh, that basically um, that, that the drug manufacturers oversold these medications. Doctors ended up prescribing them. Um, the, the manufacturers uh, uh, marketed them as not addictive, and they absolutely were. And and people, um, and it, it essentially created a crisis because you had people addicted to drugs that then they weren't being able to get prescribed that medication any longer once they were addicted. And they ended up uh, going to the streets to look for those similar drugs. And so you, you had that, you led that to a, uh, a sort of an underground prescription medication market as well as the heroin and fentanyl market. Um, and, and those are just devastating to communities. And so this was a lawsuit that, um, that has already been settled. Um, and so the question is whether or not we as a local community would like to participate. So would we like some to, free money? So it is. It's, it's similar to those uh, flyers you get in the mail asking you to, to opt in to a class action lawsuit, right? Have you eaten Fruit Loops in the last 10 years? If so, that's in this card and you can opt in to the lawsuit. Um, just on a much different and larger scale, obviously. Because, um, because it created this community-based problem, the settlements were with these individual communities, including ours. And so we're a member of the class, we just have to and that's, that's the paperwork in your packets, um, led by the Attorney General uh, of Colorado, is, is leading the charge. Um, and so it's, a, it's basically, it's free money, but it's, it's prices that we've already been paying, truthfully, right? Um, by our community, uh, has been paying the price of the effects of, of this epidemic. And, um, and so this is a chance to increase the resources um, to be able to, um, uh, provide more support to people impacted by this problem in our communities. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, there's a lot of information in the agenda, um, a, a presentation by the Attorney General that answers a lot of questions. So you don't have to get bogged down in the details of, of the MOU and then the, the associated settlement documents. Um, but, uh, but I think this would be a great thing for our community, and, and this is kind of the beginning stages for us as, as the city of Fountain. And uh, as it goes along, we'll kind of work to get our share, and, and that's a process in itself. Um, but this is the first step to, to, to be a part of the process. Right. Okay, Ms. Thompson? Oh, Mr. Applegate? Yeah, did you check in to see if we can use that money for the beacon? Uh, it's. It's unclear, but the oh. purposes are, are pretty broad. Um, I think Scott forwarded me on that question, and so um, I don't have a definite answer yet. But I think that the purposes are broad, and you know, looking at the statistics, um, people report 33 percent of people with opioid <laughs> problems are in the criminal justice system and right. have mental health problems. Seems as well. that. And so, um, you know, being able to. Um, go out on those those mental health or addiction type calls in that capacity would certainly, uh, I think we could certainly make the argument that it, it would meet a purpose. Seems like it ought to fit. Uh, it, 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 it does with, with my sort of cursory look at it, but uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what other communities are doing. Um, so that's it, a definitely a potential. That's a great question. All right. Um, Ms. Duncan? The um, CML conference that Tamara and I attended in New York, so they had an opioid um, workshop. So my question, probably maybe not to you, but to the chief, is uh, where does Fountain stand in this problem? Uh, number one, I, I think for me, from my perspective, uh, doing the cause and effect analysis that we could use this money for a beacon absolutely passes the common sense test. There's a cause and effect for mental health and crime, and those are wrapped together in treatment. And uh, I, like Troy, and many of you are familiar with what the drug companies did. And, you know, they legalized heroin, and they sold it, and they got people hooked, and it caused the problems. And now we deal with it as communities. So um, that's the first part. Um, um, what was your second question? How, how are we affected? Oh, so our number one drug of choice is meth. Um, it has been. Um, that's probably what is most familiar in Fountain. I will tell you that heroin and LSD 
have made huge comebacks on Fort Carson. Those will eventually trickle into our community. Um, LSD, because soldiers uh, fly under the radar on drug tests because they don't want to get busted and, and, and thrown out. And shrooms, which is a little disturbing because those are pretty serious. But heroin in particular has made a resurgence back on Fort Carson. But meth is our number one drug of choice and fountain that we find. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Ms. Thompson. If we're ready, I wanted to make a motion to approve resolution 21-061. And I, Tori, I really appreciate you and everybody researching this and getting us on board with this. This has been a devastating epidemic to our community. Uh, Mr. Alpgate. Second. Uh, did you have anything else further, Ms. Duncan? Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second for approval. Please vote. Six yes. Motion carried. All right. Thank you. All right. Correspondence, comments, and ex-official reports, Mr. Trainer, Mr. Evans. An update for council. We had had a discussion during budget, and the reason we didn't have it on tonight was uh, we didn't get our numbers back from the consultant. But we've got our numbers back from the consultant that is doing the pavement analysis uh, study for us on the traffic counts. And of course, the numbers were higher than what we thought they would be. Um, $24,000 to do traffic counts citywide. So we had uh, some quick discussions with Kimberly and EDC, and they have committed to pay because they are going to be able to utilize those numbers so much. They've committed to pay 15,000 of that. So we had talked about 10, so we're right at that under 10. So you'll, I'll bring that back in front of you with specific numbers uh, from the company as well as um, an approval uh, on the November 9th City Council. So just to let you know that's coming forward, but it is following your direction. Um, uh, and, and Kimberly was excited. It sounds like they're going to be able to utilize these numbers quite a bit. Awesome. All right. Uh, Troy, anything further? Nothing else for me. Chief? Nothing, Mr. Mayor. Christy, anything? Nothing. Nope. Mr. Lewis? Mr. Trilch? Yeah, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, next week I'll be traveling to San Antonio to the Association of Defense Communities Conference. Uh, this is at the invitation of Mr. Ivan Bolden, who is the Chief of Army Partnerships at the Department of the Army at the Pentagon. Uh, he asked the Fort Carson Garrison Commander and the City of Fountain to be on a panel to highlight our new intergovernmental support agreement for construction services. So I just wanted to highlight that to council and the public as a, you know, a, a great example of the good work we're doing and, and the fountain's gonna be you know, showcased there at the uh, Defense Communities Conference. All right, awesome, thank you. Anything from IT? Nope, uh, Ms. Hoffman? Nothing tonight. Uh, anything, Rosa? Okay, Ms. Duncan? I just wanna say the Salvation Army is looking for kettlebell ringers for this joyous holiday season. So if you'd like to participate in that, the Fountain Youth Council would be participating as part of our community service in teaching kids to give back to the community. So if you're interested, please contact the Salvation Army. Um, you know, Fran is here and um, one of the things that I've been doing is looking for, you know, we're looking for food sources. So I ran across this company called Compass Academy. And this company delivers meals. You know, we're getting ready to have our holiday season where our kids are gonna be at home uh, during uh, holiday breaks without meals. So, and the schools provide meals during the day. This company provides, it's called Compass Academy, and it provides um, supper and snacks that are delivered to the home, to children, K through 12. And they provide seven free dinners and snacks with milk. And how do you sign up to participate? Great question. So the parent or guardian has to go and complete an enrollment form for address verification, delivery notes, and dietary needs. It's just that easy. And they do have vegetarian, dairy-free diets. So please check online for Compass Academy. So, you know, many moons ago, I was uh, the dietitian for Silver Key Meals on Wheels program. So I'm not only um, a person at heart for our youth, I am for our seniors also. So if you're wondering what to do about uh, Medicare, it's open enrollment from October the 15th through December the 2nd, 7th, 2021. There's a program called SHIP, State Health Insurance Program. 
It's at the Pikes Peak area on aging, and you can schedule an appointment by calling 719-635-4891. And that's it. All right, thank you. Mr. Geek? The Medicare thing took me half done. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Applegate? Nothing else. Ms. Estes? Ms. Thompson? Yeah, I just wanted to make some comments when we finished. Oh, the I'm budget, sorry. Yeah, that's please. Okay. That's okay. Um, so I, you know, I'm glad we passed the budget tonight and that's great. But um, I know last week I did make, or not last, last council meeting, I did make a suggestion and I'd like to um, hopefully see the city staff pursue that. I had made an idea last week to add to the budget to set aside a substantial amount of money from our reserves for the aquatic facility. And that money would have been set aside for two years, used for building and the construction. All citizens would have had access, um, and this money would be used to show uh, different nonprofit partners that we hope to partner with the, for this, that we are serious about having an aquatic facility down here. Unfortunately, the rest of council, um, most of them, uh, didn't support it, and that's fine. That's We're a group of people. That happens. But um, I want to make sure that that keeps getting pursued. That came out to about $16.50 per citizen for the amount of money I initially suggested that was set aside for the seed money for the building of the aquatic facility. Uh, Mr. Applegate nicely suggested that we maybe we cut that that amount in half but um, I think we need to keep pursuing that because if we don't put some money aside for at least a couple of years set aside to show people in this community that we're serious about it um, building this facility in partnerships with some other nonprofits um, they're not going to look at us very seriously if we don't have any money in our budget um, that that we're going to be willing to match or work with them for for getting this going. So um, that was all I wanted to say at the end of the budget session. So if anybody wanted to talk to me some more about that, um, I do have the idea still rolling around. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. And I apologize for not seeing that earlier. Um, and I am thankful that I never have to do a budget discussion again. All right, with that, we our next meeting will be November 9th. Uh, we'll see you then. We're adjourned.